what science is and how and why it works. So Robert, so nice to see you. I think it's been a year since our last call or so. About that, yes, yes. Crazy times, hope you're doing well. Yeah, this is uh, hard to choose what's most uh, unsettling about the state of the world. Well, let's, uh, let's try to focus on something more positive and productive uh, than all the stuff that's going on. So first of all, uh, the depression lecture. So we translated it, the second one. Uh, and as of now, it has uh, around 360,000 uh, views, which is quite a lot. But I think the first one has like million or something. So uh, maybe well, people have less depression. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear there's that many people who would want to watch it. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's never a good sign. The first has 3 million views and the new one has uh, 360,000. So maybe, m maybe things getting better. Let's hope. Yeah, so uh, we had lots of actually very positive comments. The, I think it, it is good the, because lots of top comments under the lecture is actually people sharing their stories. There are people actually saying like, hey, I've had like depression for several years. I'm using like, they are like listing all the medication they're on and other people coming to respond to them like, hey, yeah, I'm using this as well. Like I'm using this as well. Lots of words of support from others and all of that. So I guess again, probably this is little positive thing that people have compassion for others that people are not afraid to share uh, like their stories. Yeah, that's particularly good. How, how much of a sense of stigma is there about mental illness at this point? That's a good question. I think it's not so much a stigma rather than just like people not talking about it. We do still get, even under the lecture, uh, people saying that, oh, depression is just sadness. Oh, just go for a walk. Oh, just get, get to work. You're just lazy. Uh, anything you have to say to such people? Um, I would say, wow, there's a lecture you should watch, but that appears to be a waste of time. Do you get such response uh, in your, I don't know, when you give this lecture live or when you talk to people in real life? Does it happen that you actually like put all the like, this is the facts, like this is the research and somebody still says, nah, they're just lazy. Yes. Um, although I think already there's self-selection as to who would be sitting there. Okay, come sit for an hour and listen about neurotransmitters. And so I think there's, there's some filtering with that already. I would say the way that mostly appears is um, you get someone who is saying, aha, this is just a lack of self-discipline. This is indulgence. This is talking about themselves and their own depression. They can say, yes, yes, medications, disease, all of that. But I don't know. I just, I I should, I should be able to just overcome this. People, people seem to very often just turn that one on themselves. Nonetheless, they somehow believe if they really were strong, if they really yeah. had the, the sufficient focus, they should really be able to overcome this because look at how much I have. <coughs> look at how much privilege, how much advantage or whatever, yet here I am. Yes, yes, yes. I know it's a biological disease, but mm -hmm. it feels as if I am still willing to beat myself up for it, which is in a sense, a measure of the depression. Another type of recurrent comment is uh, people actually worried about you and they're saying like, oh God, 
Robert looks like he's in depression. He sounds like he's depressed. Uh, <laughs> Robert, any comments? Um, first, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for the concern. Um, I don't know. This is something I've been dealing with since I was about 15. Um, I was 15 when the first doctor suggested some medication. Um, and I s decided uh, 25 years later that sure, maybe it's time to try that. Uh, so between those two points, things were very rocky at times, but you know, I'm lucky. I've, I've uh, in the care of very competent people and medication does some very helpful things, but um, I don't know. This is a very uh, hard world not to feel some <laughs> pretty major moments of uh, helplessness and despair. So I don't know. It's something I, I struggle with. I think it's always just beneath the surface. Um, if I don't get enough sleep, if I don't, mm. there, there's vulnerabilities where it's it's lurking underneath. Um, I, I always think of it as some sort of like very malevolent sea creature or something just down there. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm pretty damn lucky nonetheless. And you've said that the, the first time you've heard that you might be depressed was 1516. So couldn't that kind of like push you towards neurobiology and endocrinology and all the research you're doing now? Oh, I think absolutely. Um, you know, the brain seemed kind of interesting, although the uh, my interest in primatology and doing field work came first. Mm -hmm. And I think that was very much a reflection of my depressive makeup. I want to go live alone in a tent. Um, <laughs> and only contact with some other primate primates rather than humans. Uh, yeah, that was, that was a very, I was, I was very solitary in that regard. So the notion that that's around the period where I got very, very focused that other species off in the middle of nowhere. Interesting. Um, so the first depression lecture came out like many years ago and then now you posted the second one it doesn't feel like the new one cancels the old one it's more like an update right yeah yeah how fast like how vast are the changes and in general how fast uh the field of neuroscience in general kind of progresses do you have to actually update your knowledge every year every two years and throw everything out that you knew? Well, it depends. Um, it depends on how often you want to say, this is how this or that works in the brain um, versus this is how this or that works in the brain. Uh, kind of a lot of the time, but it turns out there's this interesting exception, how much you're spending your time saying that it's actually more complicated than that. I mean, I've, I've been, I've, I've been teaching introductory neuroscience to the, the Stanford students for 38 years. I give the same annual lectures and what I'm constantly saying is, yeah, this is how it works. It doesn't really work this way. When you look closely, um, it's not consistent and the exceptions are much more interesting than this, but for the moment, this is what we're with. Um, the reality is it changes incredibly quickly. There's this annual meeting, this thing called the Society for Neuroscience, where mm. like all of basically international, but 40,000 people show up in this, in this conference center and it's the most stressful thing on earth you can imagine everywhere you go you go into the bathroom and people are arguing about like axons and and just everywhere you look it's just an overwhelming amount of new information there's thirty thousand lectures given over the course of that week so 
all you're doing is just being overwhelmed with how much new information there is. So there's an awful lot, but a lot of it is of the, yeah, this is how things work most of the time. We used to think it worked this way all of the time. Here's what's new. It's only some of the time. Interesting. Uh, so the introductory course is the human biology of human behavior, right? Um, no, it's actually this this other class that each year we, we oh. have our new majors uh, who have declared for studying biology or neurobiology. And these are usually kids who are heading off to medical school in a few years. So this is the course they're they're forced to take this class, Introduction to Physiology, along oh. with an introduction to genetics and introduction to cell biology. So I do the introduction to the nervous system and the, the endocrine systems. So it's, um, I don't know, it's kind of uh, interesting seeing that some of these kids grow up and do some intriguing things. There, there's currently, I think, eight professors at Stanford Medical School who were students in that class at some point. So it's, uh, that should be so cool. It's just to see to see them follow follow it through and kind of like stick to it and go into academia and just like continue the passing of the knowledge and research. You know, one of them at a, at, a, at another medical school, but near here, is like the world's expert now on one neurological disease, and and it's it's very pleasing. It's also very bizarre. I have I have a bad back from a an accident in Kenya when I was twenty two, and I've needed a couple of rounds of spinal surgery to fix it. Um, and one of them, the surgeon turned out to have been my student. So that was bizarre in and of itself. And you know, he was this young hotshot surgeon in the in the neurosurgery department. And oh, and he was very nice that the evening before he like gave me a call to say, okay, so we're doing this tomorrow and we're going to take this angle because we wanted to minimize the amount of damage to the myelin. Or, and I think myelin? Myelin, I fucking taught you that word. Tomorrow, I'm going to be lying on a table with my ass sticking out there and you're going to be cutting in there. How did this happen? How did this out of the... So that was very unnerving. Um, fortunately, he did a good job. But I won't take credit for it. But yeah, in terms of the amount of stuff that's changed, um, you know, on a certain level... Uh, with a lecture on depression, the fact that a dozen years later, uh, there's a lot of new stuff to talk about. That's great. On the other hand, it's depressing as hell because we're not a whole lot better at treating it or any of these other diseases. I don't know. I, I, Alzheimer's disease for 30, 40 yeah. years, you go to a conference on it and there's always a final session and people get up and talk about new therapeutics and this has a promise to, and that one's still here 30, 40 years later, brain tumors, substance abuse, how to, how to really cure people of addictions as a neurological disease. The brain's uh, complicated. <laughs> And uh, wow. it's very hard to find out what's going on. So on one hand, that's great that there's new material to report, but mm. we still, it's not a field like polio. There's never going to be a vaccine for mm. a mental illness. There's never going to be a vaccine for a neurological disease. Um, there's never going to be a single pill that solves it. So it's always going to be slow, messy stuff. Well, hope to get more, at least more interesting research in this regard then. Anything else we should expect? Like, okay, the lectures are coming up, but any news? Uh, I don't know, another book, movie, documentary? Um, uh, well, let's see. There's, there's, um, well, I'm about to sign a contract for another book, so I think that... What's that about? 
if that and that throws me into my oh my god i'm too old to do another five year project um you know two books ago was about here's how human behavior works here's the genes yeah. the hormones and, 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 and go through all of that and then the next book was when you put all these facts together you have to conclude there's no free will so this one is when you now look at how there's no free will what's the most interesting realm in which that has relevance um how our brains break down um how do we think about mental illness why is it that you take 80 billion neurons and you throw them together you take 30 billion throw them together you get a chimpanzee it could make some tools it can do some fancy social structure stuff throw 80 billion neurons together and now you got a human who invents theology and aesthetics and economic systems and all of that what is it about you put 80 billion neurons together and in about 30, 40% of people, something goes wrong at some point into this thing that we call mental illness? Where, where are the vulnerabilities that things fall apart in those particular ways? Why should a third of humans, when brains are doing this, develop one of these mood disorders, develop one of these compulsive, repetitive behavior disorders. Why is it that like you can't have human brains being human brains without about a third of them breaking down in this way? So that's kind of what the next one is. And I have absolutely nothing to say about it at this point. That, that seems like a continuation of your depression lectures, actually. And so in this regard, should we expect any other lectures focusing on other um, uh, mental conditions? Like you have the depression one and then some other that will then be combined into a book, but like um, a lecture yeah. form? Yeah, reflecting this, this past year, I started teaching a new class, a seminar outside. Um, that was basically a psychiatric disease a week. <laughs> So depression, but anxiety disorders, bipolar disorder, eating disorders, what are called body focused repetitive disorders like obsessive compulsive disorder, people who pull out their hairs, people oh, yeah. sexual addictions. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the next direction. So this might be a series of lectures in a couple of years. Please record it. Please, please do. If you do, we'll pick it up and translate it, of course. Okay. Well, that's, I, I need about three years of reading now before I'm ready to start writing. But uh, around, around then, maybe I'll be ready for some taping some lectures as well. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Robert. See you around, I guess. Okay. We'll be in touch. You too. Bye-bye.